I just wanted to say a few words about the fact that one of the chief criticisms leveled at black culture, black consciousness, and other studies of that genre in the 70s and throughout the 80s as well was that they were limiting and fragmenting. People who, even someone like John Hyam, who had complained about the homogenizing American history, he meant about class. We forgot all the fights and we homogenized it. It was a good term. He, he argued this in 59 by the late 70s. Was He gave a talk in which he said, Larry Levine is one of the best, but even he fragments the American past. How can we understand the American past if we keep looking at it as a congeries of groups rather than as a nation, etc. <clears throat> and that still is a, a criticism. And I just wanted to say that, in fact, I think it, the opposite is true. That is, the, the, the more we study these individual groups, the more we understand the process by which, for instance, they come into the culture, they acculturate, they disseminate their own culture, they fit in with the larger culture, the more we understand that process, the more we begin to understand America. Uh, and it isn't fragmenting at all. It's, it's, it's necessary to understand how groups fit together in this, in this culture. Uh, a, a good example is the part of uh, black culture, black consciousness I spoke about where I was looking for moments of acculturation after the Civil War, when blacks were now free to move around, when they had a mobility, they were free to absorb other cultures in a way they couldn't as slaves, etc. Uh, and I thought that in the blues, which rises in the decades after slavery, I had found the chief medium of, a chief medium of acculturation. Here's a good sign of acculturation. They're now singing in the solo voice. The me is important here. I look at me. I am broke. I am lonely. I'm important. That's the post-enlightenment mm -hmm. consciousness, which blacks really didn't have in slavery. But I also found that at the same moment, the music to the blues was revitalizing. It wasn't, it wasn't acculturating. It was moving back toward the group practice, back towards what they brought with them from Africa. Revised, of course, but nevertheless. Uh, and it was that that has such a profound influence on American culture in turn. So that by looking carefully at the group, one can begin to understand its influence in American history, uh, the ways in which American history influenced it, and the process by which groups tend to acculturate, not by giving up everything they have, but by amalgamating what they have. And the only other group I know as well as blacks, almost as well, uh, Jews, uh, East European from Jews, experience. from personal experience, but I've read a lot too. East European Jews had exactly the same process. They gave and they took. They pushed forward and they pushed back. Uh, um, they held on even as they let go. And, and the process is fascinating. So, and where I, does theory fit involved? Well, you asked me that question in, a, in an email. And I thought about it a bit, and I realized I'm not a theory theory guy. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't take someone's theory, be it Freud or Foucault, um, and lay it down on the materials I have to see if they fit the theory. Or, I suppose more commonly, people take the theory and then look for examples of it. Uh, I make up, as I think most people do, though they don't call it theory, and that's okay, but it does annoy me sometimes when people say, oh, this is not theoretical at all. Uh, what I just said is a theory. It's a theory of acculturation. <laughs> it's not Marx's theory of acculturation. It's not Plato's theory of acculturation. And it's probably it's too, it's too grandiose to call it a theory at all. But it's an idea. It's a hypothesis. It's a way of beginning to sort facts. What you have to do, even if you just write, you know, maybe I should take the just out, even if you're writing pure narrative history. You have to have a selective process. You have to. You have to have something that tells you what facts you want in and what you don't, what's significant and what is less significant, and what is insignificant. Something else to tell you. That often is a kind of, that filter is often, whether you know it or not, a kind of theory. It's uh, uh, the theory is this, what's, this is what was important about the revolution and therefore I'm going to concentrate. On, on Washington's doing this and not doing that, because I can't do everything he did, even in the most 
uh, freewheeling narrative style, I've got to have some breaks. And uh, so what are those breaks? Now, the theory might be the most important thing is the most spectacular thing. It can be very unimportant, uh, but uh, that is as, as a th thought process. But some things at work, and I think it's very good to be conscious of what's at work. What, I was very conscious of the fact that I wanted to know, and I, it took a long time to refine my book, Black Culture, Black Consciousness, into two large questions. Um, what happened to African culture when, when blacks came here? And what happened to African American slave culture when blacks were liberated? Those are the two questions. And it took me a long time to understand the significance of those two questions. And I was prodded by other hypotheses uh, that blacks had no culture, that blacks lost their culture, et cetera, et cetera, that blacks were different than any other immigrant group who came to the United States because of the nature of their coming. And in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in all of this, there, there were theories. Uh, Bruno Bettelheim had a theory of infantilization. He was a psychoanalyst who himself experienced the Holocaust and who created a theory about the Holocaust asking why was there not more resistance, and he came up with the process of infantilization. And Stanley Elkins used that theory uh, on slaves. So I began by finding a theory that, I must say, uh, factually seemed wrong to me, and spiritually offended me. <laughs> uh, but we have, one has to be careful of that, of course, and we have, one has to be careful of all of this. So I think there are, there are a lot of theories all the time. And in fact, if I sat down with black culture and black consciousness and went through it, I could probably isolate many, many, many. Carl Mannheim is there, and Freud is there, and Andre Bergson is there. I use those guys. People that you've read. Or that I went to read, for instance. I had never read Andre Bergson on, on uh, laughter, but when I decided to write a chapter on black laughter, I began to read him laughter. I read Freud's fantastically interesting, insightful wit and its relation to the unconscious. I read Henri Bergson on laughter. I read a lot of books mm -hmm. and used them. My own feeling about the use of theory, which is probably influenced a bit by Hofstadter, with whom I never spoke about this, but I just watched the way he used it. Educated people read books like that. Educated people read the books they need to read, and they also, they also should keep up with uh, What's happening out there? If Foucault is having an influence, you shouldn't read a little Foucault. And, and you use those things. You use them because you're an educated person, and you use them in your writing. You use them in your thinking. Well, you use them if you feel that they're appropriate. But that's right. But no one can pretend that the unconscious has not been discovered. You know? <laughs> no one can pretend that we're aware of everything we do and the reasons for it. And so there are some things you can't escape. I mean, if you write as if there was no such thing as sexual urges, or the people, you know, that, then, then you are denying, then you're writing as if you're living in an earlier century, and that would be silly too. That, so sometimes that isn't conscious in your writing, and sometimes it's not relevant in your writing, but that's the kind of thing, I think. But a lot uh, of people now, or for the past couple of decades, have used theory much more consciously. So yes. Well, and how does that... What worries me sometimes, and I see it in, in America, I, I teach American, I teach in an American culture pro, American cultures program, cultural studies program, I should say, at George Mason University. I, I'm, I'm a member of the history department, also a member of the cultural uh, studies program, which is a graduate program. And there is a danger in making, and this happens not just in cultural studies, it happens everywhere, theory becomes a subject. You don't just use Foucault, you find yourself writing about Foucault or, or um, Derrida or any one of a number of, of these theorists. And they become more important than the subject matter. I think that, and, and that's happened with Freud and Marx and God knows. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. These, are, these should be, if you want to write about Foucault, absolutely, he's, he's fair game. He's an important thinker in, the, in an important time, and um, absolutely write books about Foucault. That's a good academic thing to do, good intellectual thing to do. But if you're writing about women in, in uh, 20th century culture, if you're writing about prisons, then you should write about prisons, and you should use Foucault as a tool.